So once again, here goes the future mission that all SpaceX fans dream of. The Starship screaming into low Earth orbit, using every bit of the fuel from the Super Heavy, plus almost all the fuel from the Starship itself until its tanks are almost completely dry. And then, of course, the Super Heavy detaching and making its way back to Earth. So, of course, most of you know what comes next. The Super Heavy makes its way back, picks up a tanker starship, and rendezvous with the original starship in low Earth orbit, and tops off the fuel. And this process has to be repeated six times in order to make a journey to Mars. As I say, a process that we've been talking about pretty much ever since Elon Musk told us about it. So, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to assume that this is the final tanker fuel top-off and the Starship is receiving the last of the fuel that it will require. Then the tanker returns to Earth and the Starship begins its journey. Except, things are going to take a bit of a twist now. You see, the Starship is not on its way to the outer solar system, but rather is on its way to the inner solar system, or to be more specific, Venus. Now, why the hell would the Starship want to go there? I mean, it's the hottest planet in the solar system, incredible pressures, sulfuric acid clouds. I mean, aside from being a purely scientific destination, why in the world would anybody want to go there? Well, this is not the Starship's final destination, but rather just a quick stop-off point. Its final destination is one that we're a lot more familiar with, and that, of course, is Mars. So, how does all of this work? How the hell does going to Venus first get us to Mars in anything resembling an efficient manner? Well, believe it or not, using this route might be more efficient, more safe, and perhaps even a little quicker. Plus, with some other lucrative benefits to SpaceX that would not be achieved by a direct voyage. How is all of this possible? Well, I'm going to explain that for you right now. episode. I've been feeling under the weather. As a matter of fact, as I'm recording this, I'm not feeling tremendously great. I'm going to try to get myself a good full night's sleep before recording the rest of this in any event. So I've given you a little bit of a teaser about an alternative method of getting to Mars, one that involves a completely different route. But I mean, how is this even remotely possible? How can going to Mars via Venus, in other words, going to the fourth planet in the solar system by using the second planet in the solar system, going to be advantageous at all? How could it possibly be faster? How could it possibly be more efficient? And what sort of things would we gain from a boiling hell hole like Venus anyway? Well, there are positive answers to just about all of these things. And I'm going to help you dig into that. And please, stay tuned. As you can see, my background has undergone a pretty dramatic change. And it's one of many dramatic changes that are coming to this channel. So stay tuned till the end of the program where I'll be covering the rest. So let's get right into it. Traveling to Mars via Venus. How the hell are we going to do that? 
The traditional way of getting to Mars is when the two planets are in conjunction, set up, so to speak, so that the distance between the two planets when you're making your journey is as short as possible, although it's still a pretty significant distance, as you can see here, and any rocket that makes this journey has to burn most of its propellant in the process, such as this case with the MAVEN probe, which was traveling at a speed substantially higher than the orbit of Mars, by the time it arrived. Since the MAVEN had used most of its propellant just getting to Mars, it had to use a technique called aerobraking to use the Martian atmosphere at reducing speed sufficiently so that it would be able to enter an acceptable orbit rather than go flying off into space, which by the way is how most Martian orbiters accomplish their mission. But how is the Starship going to do this? Well, multiple aero breakings would be difficult as this process takes weeks and would add a substantial amount of time to the transit. The current plan is to use all of the Martian atmosphere to decelerate the Starship until the last moment and then use whatever propellant it has left for a powered landing. Still, it requires that the Starship pull up at the last moment, which is a bit risky, but still doable. Nevertheless, there is another way. And this is to make the journey when the two planets are in opposition, on the opposite side of the Sun from one another. And instead of traveling straight to Mars, you travel to Venus first. Seems counterintuitive, but there is method to the madness. A recent paper, co-signed by no less than 20 experts from the JPL to the Space Research Institute in Russia, proposes that the Starship or some other vessel use Venus's gravity to slingshot it towards Mars, picking up a lot of free acceleration without having to use any propellant. The Voyager spacecraft and many other probes have used this particular technique to great effect, and in this particular case, according to the paper, it could reduce the travel time from Earth to Mars by as much as 20%, but there would be another benefit instead of shorter transit times. If you have to use less propellant to get to Mars and instead use Venus's gravity to accelerate you instead to make it within the six-month time frame, you'll have have more propellant available for deceleration. So, the more propellant you have left in your tanks, even when boil-off is taken into account, the more precise and the safer your landing is going to be. Just like in this original promotional video from SpaceX when the Starship was first rolled out, you use the atmosphere to decelerate the Starship for the initial part of the approach, and then you use the engines for the rest of the deceleration. Because after all, SpaceX has proven itself to be pretty effective at making precise landings when using engines rather than some other form of deceleration. This innovative approach seems so much safer and so much more efficient, it kind of pisses me off that nobody's come up with it before now. And there are other advantages too. If an emergency were to arise shortly after departure, you couldn't just turn around and go back. There wouldn't be enough fuel, but what you could do is use the Venusian slingshot and use that to go back to Earth. And as you can see from the diagram on the left, that dotted red line is a very, very short return trajectory compared to a free return trajectory from Mars, which would take months. But perhaps the greatest benefit of a Venusian flyby is a unique opportunity for future Martian colonists to explore another potential second home for the human species, and that's the upper atmosphere of Venus. The collapsible airship that you're looking at right now is called the Havoc, and it comes in at just under 1.4 metric tons, or at least the robotic version does, which is a tiny percentage of the Starship's cargo capacity, and it's coated in Teflon, giving it complete protection from the sulfuric acid in the Venusian clouds. 
Now this particular version of the Havoc has a human crew, but with a starship flyby that has the appropriate experts on board, humans might not be necessary, because for 12 to 24 hours, the starship would have almost real-time control of any probes, landers, rovers, or anything else they might send to the Venusian surface or into the atmosphere. Given that any probes that we've sent close to the Venusian surface tend to not survive the pressures for longer than 24 hours anyway, this might be enough time to gather all the information that we would be able to acquire in any event. But aside from this short-term science, leaving a robotic version of the Havoc long-term in the Venusian atmosphere could be a real game-changer for man's future in the solar system. The atmosphere of Venus at an altitude of 55 kilometers comes in at 27 degrees Celsius or 81 degrees Fahrenheit and has the same pressure as an 18,000 foot mountain on Earth. Much, much different than the atmosphere of Mars, for example. Once it had collected its batch of atmospheric samples, the Havoc would dispatch these, these samples to a waiting ship in orbit. But instead of a NASA vessel, as depicted here, it could be another passing starship, taking advantage of Venus's gravitational slingshot effect to take it back to Earth on a return trip. Now, not only would all this transportation for NASA, ESA, and Russian expeditions to Venus and its atmosphere rake in a fair amount of money for SpaceX, but also it could create a second presence, namely a floating presence in the Venusian atmosphere, thus guaranteeing the long-term survival of the species, giving us three presences in the solar system rather than two. And yet, there's even more that we could gain by exploring this mysterious world. Because in spite of the searing surface temperatures, in spite of the incredible pressures that have destroyed our probes within hours of their arrival, in spite of the sulfuric acid clouds and the intense lightning storms that rip this planet apart, there are strong indications that life perhaps even plentiful life, survives in the upper atmosphere of this mysterious twin of our own planet. Because this planet has not always been this hellish. This is the surface of Venus today, but it wasn't always like this once bore a greater resemblance to our own planet, including liquid water at the surface. Could life have developed there? And could it have survived all of these horrific conditions that exist there today? Well, there's strong indications in the upper atmosphere that it has indeed. Information from the Venera, Pioneer, and Magellan missions have all discovered carbonyl sulfide, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. Carbonyl sulfide is difficult to produce inorganically. It would take volcanic action to do that, and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of evidence of that. On top of this, those dark streaks in the Venusian atmosphere may be more than just atmospheric effects. UV scans of the Venusian atmosphere have indicated that these dark streaks actually absorb UV light, and it has been proposed that microorganisms could actually use UV radiation as an energy source, and further discoveries linked in the description seem to support this notion. What a thing it would be for future Martian colonists to discover that alien life exists not on one planet in the solar system, but two. So, we have a potentially quicker and more efficient way of getting to Mars, safer, more precise, and a way to abort in case we have to, and the possibility of discovering life in a new home for the human species. It gets me so excited, I think I'm going to throw in a merch plug. Uh, uh, I hope you don't mind. In any event, just go ahead and follow the description if you're interested, and uh, let's get on with the video, shall we? So I have to admit, this whole thing left me kind of awestruck in terms of all the advantages that using this particular approach of traveling to Mars is concerned. 
I really had no idea that all of these advantages existed until I started delving you know, more deeply into the topic. I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to keep up with them all. It you know, potentially uses less propellant. It could be faster, probably is actually. It enables us to abort in ways that a direct approach cannot. Not only that, it also allows us to take advantage of two launch windows. We can use the primary launch window, the one that we've always intended to use directly from Earth to Mars, and we can use this alternate method of using Venus's gravitational slingshot to go to Mars. We can take advantage of both once the travel between Earth and the Red Planet becomes a lot more frequent. I think that it's going to really open up a lot more possibilities to say nothing of the scientific advantages of giving Venus a once-over or perhaps a whole lot of once-overs during our multiple transitions between Earth and Mars. So I believe very strongly that Elon Musk, SpaceX, and NASA all need to be looking very, very seriously at this option. Now, all that having been said, as you can see, I'm talking about SpaceX, I have a lot of SpaceX memorabilia that I have added thanks to my Patreon supporters. These are all 2015 travel promotional posters, Olympus Mons, Bobos and Deimos, and the Ballas Marineris. I find them to be very compelling, very retro, very cool. So thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. I hope that you folks find that this fleshes out my set a little bit, and I'll be adding more as time goes on. And if you want to continue to support not only the quality, but also the future of this, of this channel, please consider being a Patreon supporter. The link is in the description, and all of my supporters, the newest ones, and others are being recognized right now. So, all that having been said, get ready for some big changes coming to the Angry Astronaut on top of the changes that I've already made. And until we're ready to make our journey to Mars and to think outside the box and look at every possibility when it comes to this magnificent adventure that we are about to embark on, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>